Hello, sisters and brothers. This is Ken. Hey, I think I found another very interesting piece. If somebody else has found this, I didn't know about it. I just found this. It's exciting. Uh, obviously, I want to get it out quickly. And where we're living right now, that's pretty much the way it will always be. Just get the information out. So here you see the picture, of course, of Joseph's dream with the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine represented by the, the cows, like the dream he had. So the question is, are we living in a um, time that was foreshadowed by this, by seven years of, of plenty, which will then quickly transition to famine, as represented by the black horse? Um, obviously, a good case can be made that that will happen um, when the transition occurs. Before we go there, um, I'm going to go back to our good old friend Chuck Missler. Please listen to this clip from Chuck. It's about six and a half minutes, and the way it ties in, I think, is very interesting. People ask me frequently, are there hidden codes in the Bible? And uh, there absolutely are. There's so much nonsense and so much contrived uh, foolishness around that many people get uh, disenchanted with the idea of hidden messages in the scripture, but they are there, and I want to show you a few. Proverbs 25, 2 tells you that. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it's the honor or duty of kings to search out the matter. Way back in the 16th century, Rabbi Cordovero pointed out that the secrets of the Torah are revealed in the skipping of letters. So this idea of Bible codes is not a new idea. It's a rediscovery of things that were known centuries ago. There are dozens of different kinds of encryptions in the scripture. And I'm not going to go through all those here, relax. But there's one particular kind that is called an equidistant letter sequence. And it's the one that's being very much abused by, by promoters and things. But nevertheless, there are some that are real. The equidistant letter sequence. Here's an this is a contrived example to give you an idea what they are. On the screen, there's a sentence. Rips explained that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word. That's just a, an arbitrary sentence I put on the screen. But it turns out that if you take every fourth letter of that, that's an equidistant letter sequence of the spacing of uh, three between each letter, you then discover that every fourth letter forms another message. In this case, it's, it says, read the code. This is just a demonstration to give you a feeling for what we mean by an equidistant letter sequence. This technique was known to the ancient rabbis. This is one of many. When those uh, rabbinical experts rose to power in the courts of Europe during the Renaissance period, they were the experts that contrived the cryptography available to the various kings. So if you study the history of secret writing or cryptography, You'll discover it really has its roots in the, among the ancient rabbis in ancient Israel, and it's traceable through the courts of Europe as they invent better and more sophisticated codes, leaning on their, their, their insights. And it, because the codes got so sophisticated in World War II, the, uh, uh, we developed computers to break the codes. That's what Turing uh, in, in uh, 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 John von uh, Neumann in the United States and Alan Turing in Britain were the two experts that really gave us the modern computer. But his original mission was to, to break the Nazi codes, which it did. But it's interesting that those same computers have now allowed us to rediscover the very things that the rabbis knew thousands of years ago. And so it's a very fascinating study. But let me just give you one example to give you a flavor of this. This is uh, Genesis chapter 1 in Hebrew. Now, I want to remind you that Hebrew goes from right to left. Also, the word Torah in Hebrew is spelled with four letters. A ta, which is roughly equivalent to our T, an O, a resh, a he, um, four letters. If you go to the first how in the book of Genesis, and uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet that happens, and you count 49 letters, you come to a vav, you count 49 more letters, and you come to a resh, which is sort of like our R, and you count 49 more letters, you come to a hey. So that is four, those four letters spelled Torah. Now, I need to remind you that all languages flow towards Jerusalem. Did you know that? All nations east of Jerusalem go from right to left. 
All nations west of Jerusalem go from left to right. All languages flow towards Jerusalem. I don't know what you're going to do with that piece of information, <laughs> but I think it's interesting. Now, you can follow this without knowing Hebrew, probably, but you say, now, why 49? Was the square of seven? Okay, that's fine. That's not, that, not too surprising, but just a coincidence, of course. Or is it? Now, you could argue, well, that's just an accident of the frequency of letters and so forth. It's kind of rare, but interesting. Except what happens is when you go to the book of Exodus, you go to the first tau, count 49 letters, you get a vav, 49 letters, you get a resh, 49 letters, and you get a hey. Same thing happens. What's the probability of that? Whatever the first probability is, it's that squared. <laughs> okay? So it's very unlikely. Genesis, Exodus, you go to Leviticus and it doesn't happen. And when it doesn't, you almost feel a sigh of relief. Huh? But when you go to Numbers, the same thing happens backwards. You take the first hey, the first resh, the first vav, the first tau, you get Torah spelled backwards. Now that's weird. What's weird. If nothing else, I don't know how they found this out. They must have had time on their hands. You know. <laughs> they didn't have computers. You know, this was... You go to Deuteronomy, you have essentially the same equivalent thing happens. And now you're puzzled because you've got it forward, forward, backward, backward. You can't resist going back to Leviticus and looking at Leviticus more closely. We have 49 and the 7 squared letter sequences. Torah, Torah, forward in Genesis, Exodus, uh, backwards in Numbers and Deuteronomy. Well, if you look at Leviticus, you discover that every seventh letter spells the unpronounceable name of God, often rendered Jehovah or Yahweh, re-expressed re, uh, uh, as Adonai among the Hebrews. They won't pronounce that name. They'll use the, Lord, the word Lord instead. Well, now we stand back from all of this. We have the, the name of God, and we suddenly realize that the Torah always points to the name of Jehovah. Now, what's the chance of that happening by accident? And by the way, if you've tried to contrive something like this and still maintain logic in the text, that's a challenge. This is a very non-trivial thing to design if you set out to design it that way. So uh, many of us tend to regard these kinds of things in general as fingerprints of the Holy Spirit. So that teaching, which in and of itself is very interesting for sure, but it got me thinking, does the same designer of the Bible codes perhaps do similar things with a timing of eclipses and a timeline? So that got me to thinking and got me to digging into the eclipses over this 14-year span, this 14-year timeline. So as you can see, what I've discovered is that if you put this next blood moon on May 26th, 2021, in the middle, and then look at the other solar eclipses. These are only full eclipses, full solar eclipses on each side. We see that there are a lot of symmetries on the timeline. Okay, so if we start in the middle and you look at May 26th and then you, and you branch out, you see that there are the two nearest to the middle of the timeline, both occur during Hanukkah, December 14, 2020, December 4, 2021. Both happen to be during Hanukkah. Okay. Then if you look at the next pair out, they each occur exactly 694 days from the May 26, 2021 eclipse. Okay, and then if you branch out again to the next solar, pair of solar eclipses, you see the Great American Eclipse pair, the August 21, 2017, which made the yellow line there across the United States, and then its counterpart, April 8, 2024. So now they're not spaced the same number of days, but they have that in common. Okay, they have, they have in common that they're making the X across the United States. Then branch out even farther, and you have the next pair, which is exactly 1,904 days from the center line of the timeline. Then the next one branch out, and it's 
2259 days from the center of the timeline. So now I have also the other blood moons in here, but they really don't play that much of a role in this aspect. And that is the, the symmetry aspect. So we have May 26, the lunar blood moon, if that's in the middle, then every solar eclipse, every full solar eclipse, we're not counting the partials, they're not in here. No partial eclipses are in this timeline at all. If you only count those, then you have 10 eclipses, and all of them seem to have a counterpart on the other side of the timeline. Either number of days, three pairs have exact numbers of days, and then you have the pair that have in common that they're on Hanukkah, and then the pair that have in common that they're making the X across the United States. So take with that what you will. I would also consider um, what is the likeliness? I'm not just going to arbitrarily proclaim that it's astronomical and this can never possibly happen and you can't make this stuff up, blah, blah, blah. I'd like to be a little more responsible than that and actually consider what the, these likelihoods might be. Okay, so a a solar eclipse, a full solar eclipse happens, and you can, if you Google solar eclipse frequency, you can find this uh, on the average about one every 18 months. And that's about what we see, about one every 18 months it happens. So if you consider the first one on March 20, 2015, let's say, okay, that's a given. And let's say that we'll just also say that the blood moon on May 26, 2021 is a given. What is the probability that you're going to find that exact spacing? Well, they only occur doing, during the full moons, that is the solar eclipse, and it's one out of every 18. So it's one out of every 18 full moon. So the chances of that happening, just one of them, would be one out of 18. Okay. And then the chances of the second one having the match would be another one out of 18. And then that compiles. So that becomes uh, one divided by 18 squared, which would be a probability of one out of 324. But then you get to the third one. And we're going to kind of shelve the other the Hanukkah and the, and the American eclipses because they're unique in those regards. But for three out of three to have matching pairs, the probability would be one out of 5832. Call it one out of 6,000. Pretty unlikely. Not astronomical, but pretty unlikely. But then when you also compound the fact that two others also have a match based upon other things such as Hanukkah and making an X across the United States, Seems compelling to me. You be the judge. I think it's pretty interesting, though. Am I saying that means the rapture happens May 26? No, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that this late May, I would say May 17 through May 26, is a very, very, very high watch time. And I think this is even more evidence of that. And now on a somewhat different topic um, as we record this, tomorrow is May 14th, and I know a lot of people are very excited about it being the 73rd birthday of Israel. However, actually, if you consider the Jewish lunar calendar, uh, Israel's birthday will fall on May 17th. If you look on the left side of this screen, this is from TorahCalendar.com, the left side is 1948, month 3. You can see that the fourth day of the third month is their Independence Day. And in that year, that fell on our Gregorian calendar, May 14. Now, on the right, we have month 3, 2021. And then if you you see in the um, Independence Day also on the fourth day of the third month on the lunar calendar, and that falls on May 17, and then to the right of that, you see Shavuot. Um, I'll zoom in, and there, in case you couldn't read those, you can see where it's Independence Day on the fourth day, which again was it was May 14 in 1948, but this year it, that falls on May 17, which adds even more um, credibility to all the clues pointing to May 17, or perhaps May 18, or 20, or 26, definitely a very, very, very high watch time. So that's all I have for this time. God bless. Love you all. Bye-bye.